All right, now we are live. So, uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome back to uh, Red War Rubbery. We have a uh, treat here for you tonight. Uh, we have a gentleman putting his academic reputation on the line by joining us, uh, Motley Crew, here at Emerging Revolutionary War. That is uh, Dr. Paul Lockhart, the author of The, the Whites of Their Eyes, um, among others, Bunker Hill. So, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Paul, for joining us tonight. Um, also joining me is Dan Davis. Um, who's um, also putting his reputation with the American Battlefield Trust uh, on the line here. Uh, but we go back uh, two decades now, so he's, he's used to my antics. But um, for that, thank you, Paul, for joining. And um, right. well, thanks, Dan. so we uh, appreciate it. But uh, so without further ado, let's just jump into the topic, because uh, I know Bunker Hill will arouse uh, a lot of interest. Um, and uh, we thank everyone who's tuning in that's not watching the NFL tonight. So uh, we're the alternate uh, option for you. So, uh, Paul, um, why Bunker Hill? That's a good question. There's a kind of circuitous story, so I, 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 won't, I won't torture you with the entire thing. Um, I started out really as a Civil War buff, and so getting back, getting to the Revolution was was a, a, exactly a stretch for me. I grew up in the Hudson Valley, and so I was surrounded by, you know, the Windsor Atonement was right across the river from where I grew up, and I lived not far from, from Steuben's headquarters, and um, so that was it kind of felt like home. But um, as I got interested in um, the European context of the American Civil War, which is a bit of, bit of an eye opener for me as an undergraduate, um, you know, it occurred to me that so much American military history had been written outside of that context and that American military historians could be pretty insular. And uh, um, in particular with Bunker Hill, as I as I. Uh, Reacquainted myself with the classic narratives about it, Richard Ketchum's, uh, Tom Flexner's, uh, Tom um, uh, Fleming's, for example, um, that um, there was so much about the the battle that so much about the accepted narrative that just seemed to be wrong. It just didn't gel with what I knew of 18th century warfare, which I'd kind of you know, started pushing back into when I was a, when I was an undergraduate. Um, and I think more so than almost any other American Revolutionary War battle, um, the you know, some of the wrong assumptions that that we tend to make about 18th century warfare um, really come into play in shaping in shaping that narrative. Um, it also struck me as interesting that 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 Bunker Hill, you know, of, of the of the iconic battles of the Revolution, in, in some ways is kind of the least important. You know, it's not it's not especially large. Um, it's it's definitely a, a significant British victory. I think sometimes we oftentimes forget that it's not a, not a small deal the British take <laughs> to the, the heights of Charlestown, um, but that it it uh, it sticks in the memory like few other Revolutionary War battles. I remember I had a discussion with some other Revolutionary War scholars once, and we're talking about the the most recognizable battles of the Revolution. I said by far Bunker Hill. I uh, won't well, no, what about Saratoga? What about Yorktown? Well, you know, I, I've taught freshman uh, uh, freshman students at Western Civilization surveys, you know, since the late 80s. And I can tell you for a fact that while the, the, the vast majority of them have never heard of Saratoga or don't remember hearing of Saratoga or Yorktown or Monmouth or Cowpens or what have you, but they'll know Bunker Hill was a battle. They might not be able to place what war it was in or who fought it, but they know it's a battle. Um, and, and that's that's saying something for a, you know for an event in American military history, even if even if the details are fuzzy to you know in in, in popular perception. So yeah, that, that that iconic nature and and the fact that there seem to be there seem to be a, a bunch of issues with with the accepted narrative that just made it made it fun to go after. Uh, and then another level. Yeah, I, I remember the moment. I think I was probably seven or eight years old when I first saw uh, the Howard Pyle painting of um, of the British marching up the hill, and it, it sucked me in like few like few um, historical you know, works of, the, of genre art ever have. Yeah, now that's. Uh, I mean, I remember the painting. Um, remember the uh, trips as well, like being suckered in about uh, six or seven. Actually, Fort Ticonderoga and getting my try corner hat i think was the yeah, introduction. Yeah. i also grew up in the uh more of the civil war area being uh near baltimore and antietam and all that but um uh as we dive into uh, bunker hill though one of the things i really liked about your book uh was the events from april 19th to june of uh 1775 i mean we always hear the narrative hey they the glorious 19th they show up they fight um Let's bring uh, what happens between that time, the, 
to keep the army or people together? Like, what's going on? Are they just going home, coming back? That's actually in a nutshell. They're going home and coming back. <laughs> uh, and one of the things that, to me, that's so fascinating about it is that um, is that it's so difficult to pin down how the size of this Grand American Army as it materializes between the 20th of April and well, 19th of April, actually, and uh, in, in the middle of June. Um, and any one day, it's the, the the numbers are going to be dramatically different one from one day to the other, um, which you know it's a, simply a reflection of of the you know the nature of military organization in in um, in colonial New England um, and the in the perception amongst those who had volunteered that um, you know, they had done their job on the 19th of April the British had been forced back into Boston and what else is there to do um, you know had it not been for the fact that people like Joseph Warren um, had um, um, you know, essentially made the decision uh, to, um, to, to 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 start things here. Um, that, um, you know, this, this would have been a, you know, kind of an ephemeral rural revolt. Um, but the, uh, yeah, the, the, what, what's going on is the very beginnings of making an army. And, and, and it's clear that, uh, that, you know, even by the time that uh, the battle of Bunker Hill, it still isn't really an army. When Washington shows up in early July, it still isn't really an army. Um, but the fact that, that so many, you know, probably in the realm of 10 to 12,000 men uh, stick around in the environs of Boston uh, for, for that length of time to, to greet Washington shows that something dramatic kind of happens between, uh, between April and, and July. So uh, who, who is the guy? I mean, we said Warren, we've had a uh, good friend, uh, Christian Despigna, both of us on here. And he said, Warren was Washington before Washington was Washington. Yeah. Um, which is, but who else uh, is one of those guiding forces that may not have be recognized to most people that study the war? Who's that well, guiding mean, force? There's several, you know, and 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 it's a you know, it's an interesting ensemble cast that doesn't, you know, never really functions together as a command staff. Um, but to me, the most critical figures are Warren, of course, because I think among other things. You know, Warren is able to bridge that gap between the Massachusetts Provincial Congress and the Committee of Safety and the um, and the Army itself. Um, but as as I think I mentioned to you before, my my hero in all this is Artemis Ward, um, and it's somebody I think is has been done many injustices. And I'm not usually the kind of person who who uh, uh, who, who uh, touts individuals as being, as being unfairly treated by historians. But I think in Ward's case, it's pretty it's pretty glaring. Um, that the you know, the the overall consensus, um, and you see this in um, um, you know even works by reputable academic historians, uh, the you know the judgment of Ward comes straight from the words of Washington and and uh, and James Warren, not Joseph, but James, uh, who detested Ward, and so you know the the the, uh, the characterization of him as a Yankee church warden or a man so fat he could barely mount his horse, or you know any of these mostly hyperbolic descriptions. Um, have actually survived the generations um, to um, you know, to I think to to do end up end up doing what Ward a, a gigantic disservice. I mean, it's unjust. I mean, Ward is not Ward is a what a French Indian War veteran, I believe. Mm -hmm. He is, uh, I mean, head of the militia, and so I mean, it's it's not his fault. He's suffering from bladder stones and and everything else. At the time, so I mean, he does have the military background, correct? And, and yeah, and, and but I, I think nobody would ever accuse him of being a you know of being a tactical or strategic genius, and nor would Ward have claimed that for himself. Um, just a steady, reliable um, person, not a gambler. And the point I tried to make with, with white to their eyes is that one thing the Grand American Army did not need was a gambler. Um, it, the, the 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 stakes were too high and the margin of error too thin uh, for something like that. But yeah, the Ward was Ward's a veteran, and granted, not in the way that say um, Israel Putnam or John Stark were. In other words, you know, he's not he's not a captain of in, in Rogers Rangers. There's no you know no, no great great tales of bravery. I mean, he, he was in the uh, 1758 campaign against um, you know the French at, at Carillon. Um, uh, and part of that, but he, uh, you know, his, his, his experience was primarily as an administrator, which was actually perfect. This is what the, you know, what the what the troops outside of Boston need. 
Um, and, and, and then another level, and this is where I, you know, I, where I, when I first <laughs> I fell in love with Ward, when I start, first started to admire Ward, it was that, you know, the story of him um, on the days immediately following um, the last session of the Massachusetts Provincial Congress before uh, Lexington and Concord, and then his response to the alarm. And when he went, when he went home from, uh, from the Provincial Congress, he's sick. And, and genuinely uncomfortable, and immediately goes to bed. And the day after the day after the alarm, you know, it's a, really a matter of hours after the um, the the uh, uh, fair at Lexington is announced in in the in the, in the center of Shrewsbury where he, where he lived. Um, he's on a horse riding by himself to Cambridge, he was 40 miles by himself in a day, um, suffering from bladder stones. And you know, as far as he knew, there's a hangman's noose waiting for him at the end of it. He really didn't know what he was getting into, and but he went and. You know, I, I I made this remark once, kind of unfairly, that Washington's oh Washington's twiddling his thumbs at uh, uh, at Mount Vernon. You know, uh, Artemis Ward is 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 suffering for the cause already, and already committed to it before he even fully knew what it was. Um, but either way, I did you know any kind of characterization of him as being um, less than devoted to the cause is really genuinely unfair. Um, the the man represented. You know, a, uh, I think I think patriotism in its in its purest form. Um, but also, he was an administrator. You know, he, I I think uh, um, as much as much as as um, Washington and Charles Lee, who probably had the, the the worst, the most critical words to say about about war and about war rather. Um, much as they uh, complained about the quality of the army that they found in in July of 1775, uh, if it weren't for Ward. Essentially, creating a um, an infrastructure from scratch, including a, a, a actually pretty smoothly functioning commissary, um, that uh, there wouldn't have been anything there waiting for Washington and, and Lee uh, by the time they showed up. So, um, and there's another, you know, there's a, a separate, obviously a separate issue altogether that I think Ward is is instrumental in making sure that the defeat at Bunker Hill doesn't mark the end of the American Revolutionary cause, which I think it could well have been. No, I mean, you know, Ward is one of his own son who's a John Thomas or whatever down at the Rock in the Roxbury yeah. area as well. Um, I mean, that's there's a, and then of course we can argue that Charles Lee's asterisk tongue is because he's got something to gain as well. If Artemis oh, yeah. Ward leaves because he's number two, um, let's be honest, Lee would not didn't get along with too many no, no. Like <laughs> no. Um, throughout the war. Um, but uh, that's uh, what I found remarkable as well is that we kind of gloss over in history because April 19th. Mid June, early July, you forget there's what some 60 days in between April and June, and these guys have got to figure out how to form. And so Ward is probably the best person at that um, location. Um, so with that being said, how does with all these histories of Bunker Hill and all these uh, accounts, um, one of the things we talked about beforehand was a slight interpret different interpretation that you brought, and I really like that about your book. So did you want to elaborate on? Why you differ from the Flemings, the Philbricks? Sure, and, so uh, and you know, there's and there's a couple of things. One one of them, of course, that you know, the the sources for Bunker Hill. I mean, Revolutionary War battles in general, space, and I've, I've been, this is this is coming from somebody whose career started really with working with the Thirty Years' War, and and battle narratives there are really hard to construct. Um, but in comparison, for example, the reconstructing Civil War combat, it's, it's pretty challenging. The, the, the you know the sources are. Are spotty, and, and this is certainly the case for Bunker Hill. You know, there's a there's a wealth of material that was collected on the 50th anniversary, or around the 50th anniversary of 1825, that's still under lock and key at the Mass Historical Society. Um, much of which was proven to be fabricated, you know, by essentially old men who just wanted to wanted to tell a story. Um, people who had not actually been at Bunker Hill or not even actually fought in, in the Revolution. Um, but you know the, the accounts that we have are, are are fairly sporadic, which which doesn't help. Um, but the um, so much of the common narrative of of Bunker Hill is, I think, part by a, 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 first of all, you know, one of the one of the um, one of the one of the big influences is the fact that this is a this is a great American battle. I have made the argument a couple of times. This is the great American battle, right? American underdog versus uh, 
uh, versus a superior foreign force. And, and, and granted, it's not a victory, but, uh, um, but the Americans give more than a, more than a very good account of themselves. Um, the, um, the, the, the fact that it's already tinged with, um, um, you know, with that kind of patriotic, um, uh, that kind of that kind of patriotic impulse, you know, the, the, the different the distinction between heritage and history, for example, um, automatically lends itself to hyperbole. And um, you know, what I related in the book that I've, I've had this discussion with a number of people who have written about it, um, the um, the uh, uh, story of Elijah Proctor. I remember the, the man's name, the man who was at, uh, and I'm drawing a blank here, um, the man who was with uh, Gage watching the battle. Um, and uh, allegedly was able to identify William Prescott on the um, on, on the parapet of the redoubt in, in Charlestown um, using a, a spyglass at the time at a distance of you know, what about two and a half miles after hours of artillery bombardment and essentially no wind. You could not identify anybody at that distance. I don't care what kind of clothing they were wearing. Um, but that that story that Gage asks. Gage asks if, if if Prescott will fight. Well, I can't answer for his men, but as for Prescott, he'll fight you to the gates of hell. And I mean, it it, it sounds like a line from a from a '60s John Wayne movie. I mean, it's, it's so it just seems so contrived. Uh, and but that kind of sentiment um, is you know what informs a lot of the uh, um, the narrative about Bunker Hill. And I, and I think also um, you know the the general patriotic national mythology portrayal of the revolution um you know where, where we like to see the british you know as, in, as encapsulated for example in the mill, mill gibson's the patriot right the british are simultaneously the best army in the world led by the worst foppish officers who are entirely who've never fought in a, a, a place with trees and hills before apparently you know 18th century european warfare was fought on carefully manicured lawns and you know and tennis courts or something um and and they're and they're stymied by 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 wilderness you know, for, com conveniently for forgetting the fact that the british of course have been fighting in north america for a while and we're very familiar with with wilderness warfare um that um that notion of making the you know making the british um simultaneously the, you know, the best infantry in the world but led by officers who intentionally make stupid decisions in order to show their contempt for america Right. So you know how is how launches three frontal assaults on uh, on, on on the redoubt, even though uh, that, that's a ridiculous notion, right? Um, that uh, you know that 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 kind of perception of the you know the the maverick American with unique and superior mar martial qualities versus you know the represent rep representatives of, of warfare in the old world. Um, really is played out in, in the Bunker Hill narrative, I think more so than any other American Revolutionary War battle. Um, and, and I think that's really what, you know, what, what shapes a lot of the, um, a lot of the narrative. So to give you an example, um, uh, from, um, uh, this would have been Richard Peckham's interpretation of, 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 of the battle, um, he mentions how, how his troops are uh, each going into battle, carrying the weight of a, of a, of a, of a dressed deer on their shoulders, you know, incredibly burdened. Now, we know, first of all, from lots of sources that, you know, the, the British heavy marching order, including everything, was probably weighed close to about 60 pounds. Um, and, and, and how stipulates in his orders that morning, as the men are to carry nothing but muskets, ammunition, cartridge box, um, and a day's cooked rations, nothing else. You know, the tents and blankets, they'll catch up to you, right? But right now, just carry the minimum. He's, he's, he's a light infantryman. That's the way he works. But but this notion that the British are, you know, like all European armies are impractical and formal has to, you know, that has to shape the narrative rather than the actual documents. Um, and I just find this again, you know, it, it seems like a pretty trivial issue, but there's hundreds of them when it comes to the, you know, the Bunker Hill story. Um, that all you know, collectively uh, you know, push, push, a, push, really push the narrative of the battle in a, in a slightly different direction. Um, uh, you know, it doesn't ch change how the battle comes out, but it certainly puts a different light on um, on Ward and on on William Howe and and on and on Thomas Gage as uh, as battlefield commanders. Yeah, and that uh, Paul, something you just mentioned, actually, several things you just mentioned, kind of you know. Um, 
pick my uh, curiosity a bit. And, you know, we've been talking a lot about, uh, obviously, the Americans with Artemis Ward and touching a little bit on Joseph Warren. I think one of the more tragic characters of the Bunker Hill story is, in fact, Thomas Gage. Uh, yeah. Gage is, you know, and he's one of those individuals. He's a veteran of the French and Indian War, like Artemis Ward. He fought at the Battle of Monongahela. He was at uh, the July 1758 attack on Fort Ticonderoga or Carry On. And, you know, he's a royal governor of Massachusetts, commander in chief, British Army and 13 colonies. And he seems to me, because of his relationship, because of his knowledge of the colonists from all his, the time that he spent there and spent fighting alongside them, you know, he's sort of trying not to make a bad situation worse from really from 1774 on. And then you have the 19th of uh, April, the fighting at Lexington and Concord. Give us your assessment about Thomas Gage. I mean, I I, uh, I, I kind of think of him sitting in the province house, and you know, in early April or rather late late April of 1775, just kind of looking around, wringing his hands and saying, gosh, what should I do next? Oh, knowing yeah. that, oh. uh, knowing that, hey, pretty soon I've got three major generals on their way over here. My time might be ticking away here in Boston. I may not be here for very much long, longer after the summer, after the fall. Oh, no, no, that's a great, that, that's a good assessment of Gage, and I, I, I agree. I, I, in fact, I see a lot of parallels between Gage and Ward uh, in the sense that both were men who had very few options in front of them and uh, were damned if they do and damned if they don't, you know, and, and it, it almost didn't matter what decisions they made. It would be, the, to somebody, it would be the wrong decision. And with Gage in particular, you know, first of all, the fact that he he knows Americans, and he's married to an American, and and he likes Americans. Um, he hates being in Boston. I mean, I think most British officers did. You know, New, New York was certainly more more comfortable place to be. Um, but uh, but I, he understood what was going on. You're right. He's trying not he's trying not to make a bad situation worse, um, and to you know hopefully dampen down any possibility of of a violent outburst by you know occasional shows of force. You know, British patrols you know, out, outside of Boston into the, into the, into the hinterland, um, for example. But, but as a, um, uh, in, in virtually every other regard, I mean, Gage knows what's going on. He knows what he needs and he constantly asks for it. I mean, it's one of the things that's so, uh, especially from the fall of 1774 on, now I feel so bad for Gage and he's constantly asking London, I need more troops and I need boats. You know, <laughs> I don't, I don't really need ships of the line. I mean, those are great, but I need boats. I need whale boats. I need small craft. Uh, because eventually we're going to have to do some you know, the amphibious operations are going to be necessary at some point. And, and he's roundly ignored. Um, and so, you know, perception after uh, well, even before the 19th of April, I think back in back in London is that gauge is a failure. Um, the um, and so the, you know, the the fact that he's able to swallow his pride and work with. Howe and Burgoyne and, and Clinton, I think was also a, you know, a, a good measure of the man. Um and his um, his decisions, where it comes to um, um, where it comes to, first of all, the the planned British offensive that was supposed to happen on the 18th of June, um, and the actual conduct of the battle that took place on the 17th. He shows a man who really who understood, you know, that, that he was a, a competent, more than a competent tactician. Also, one of the interesting things, and this was, you know, I I, I give a lot of credit to. Um, Matthew Spring, you know, whose book um, with zeal and with bayonets only. Is, I mean, that should have turned over any every Revolutionary War scholar's understanding of the British Army in North America. Um, that um, that Gage, you know, among other things, is he's encouraging, he's encouraging, actually requiring uh, the individual regiments in the Boston garrison to teach their men marksmanship. I mean, it's <laughs> You know, it goes against a lot of the you know the stereotypes we have about British officers and about about about, uh, about European tactics of the New World. I mean, Gage is Gage is a, I, I can't think of anything really negative to say about him. Um, but he, and it's kind of tragic, just like with Ward. I mean, that, that his career ends kind of ignominiously. Um, and it wasn't just a matter of that he did the best he could. It, it was again, he was in a situation where there was there was really no 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 really no no way out for him. That makes any sense? No, exactly. I mean, the more you read about him, I mean, how many times have we seen in American military history where the military leader in the operating zone is trying to argue with the political force sitting miles and miles or distances away, and the dis yeah. and the disconnect? I mean, yeah. Gage knows what he needs. It's not just a. I mean, 
And then I think Dartmouth, and later Jermaine, all those, they don't have any semblance of the man, the how big this is, how much the countryside, how, I mean, even yeah. Grant says, I can take 5,000 troops and walk through. Um, then he gets here and he, he also fumbles it. But also Gage as well is, I mean, letting people like Warren and other ones continue to operate inside of Boston. That's always found, like, I mean, oh, yeah. he doesn't slam down. He's trying, I mean, it shows that he is trying to find the best course of action. And I think that um, he's on the opposite. He might be the best guy possible with the I mindset think, that he had. I think so. Just, and, I, and, I, and I think, you know, a lot of the critical, a lot of the, the criticism of Gage, in fact, in general, I think one of the things that drew me to Bunker Hill and kind of the addendum to what I said earlier is the fact that we see, uh, you know, so many so many leaders are dismissed not just by contemporaries but by historians two centuries later as having been incompetent. And, and granted, especially with military history, it's very easy to do. I mean, historians lapse into the role of armchair general all too easily. Um, and as I as I try to tell my students all the time, and especially my my graduate students in, in military history, you know, the most important virtue that an historian um, can can cultivate besides accuracy is empathy. And empathy doesn't mean sympathy necessarily, but it means trying to put yourself in that person's position. And and I and I see in so many treatments of of um, British and American command uh, at um, in, uh, in in the siege of Boston, you know, a complete lack of empathy and uh, on the part of historians, not really seeking to understand the conditions in which in which these men function. Um, yeah. There's also another. Really, other no, answer, sorry. I'm sorry. Um, sorry. No, go on. I was just going to build on that point, but. I was, you know, this is an addendum, I think, also to everything's an addendum to something. Um, in terms of my interpretation of, of the battle, um, that um, uh, it occurred to me as I as I read more about this, and of course as I got to learn more about Lexington and Concord as well, and then and then reading you know British uh, British assessments of the battle afterwards. Um, I think, generally speaking, when we as you know, as historians or as history enthusiasts look back in, 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 in military history in particular, um, we um, we like to make the assumption, um, as is said often, for example, of, of, of the British of the British expeditionary forces in the First World War, that you know, we're looking at lines led by donkeys. Right? The enlisted men are um, are usually the ones who are shafted by incompetent officers. And what we see at Bunker Hill, certainly with the British, is pretty pretty competent officers and pretty brave officers who are leading an army that's completely raw. I mean, I mean they're, they're better drilled than the Americans, and they have an infrastructure the Americans don't have. They know how to fun, they know how to operate in battalions rather than you know Americans who have learned you know basically learned the manual of arms at the at the squad level. Um, I was a teenage drill head, so I'm sorry if I you know lapse into these things, but I but. Uh, uh, but they have as little experience of combat as the Americans do, and you know you keep running this again and again with the with the with the, with the British accounts of the battle. The soldiers are either they're either you know, deer in the headlights, they're just they're they're paralyzed with fear, um, or they drop to the ground and just stop functioning. And officers are suffering these huge casualties as they're trying to get their men um, uh, going. Um, and and that's you know again one of those um, one of those aspects of I think of. Um, uh, of our of our uh, of what we like to see in a battle narrative um, that uh, that we don't see with Bunker Hill, right? not, not 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 we rather the sources don't point us in that direction. If that makes any sense. Yeah, and I think of the British officers there. Obviously, John Pitcairn is the one that you that obviously comes to mind with everybody. He's I believe he's wounded twice before he, the fatal shot. Yeah, he, he uh, refuses to leave the field, refuses uh, to leave his men. But also, in a, you know, kind of overshadowing that is Francis Rowden, the Fifth Regiment of Royal. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Lord, yeah, Lord Rowden, who you know we'll come to know later on as historians during the New York campaign, and obviously in the South, the battles of Camden and Hobkirk Hill. So, yeah, I, I, I uh, could not agree more about your point with the officers and the men. It, it is reflected in the casualties. I mean, I, I, I've, um, um, you know, I, I, I point out in, and I point this out in general about, about about American warfare that, you know, we have to keep in mind that, first of all, 18th century warfare is very bloody. Um, we, you know, we, there's this tendency, I think, before people like uh, Patty Griffith and, and uh, Earl Hess were writing about it to assume that, 
you know, with the advent of the rifle musket that all of a sudden infantry combat becomes far bloodier. And it really is not significantly bloodier. The Smooth War era is just as bloody. So 40% casualties in the British Army overall, yeah, it's about what Frederick the Great's army suffers at Colin in 1757. I mean, it's pretty, it's it's on the high side, but it's certainly within the parameters for an 18th century battle. But but British officer casualties, I'm trying to remember the percentage, but I but I remember that that this kind of kind of sobering statistic that a quarter of all British officer of all British officer casualties from the entire war happened at Bunker Hill, um, which is just that's obviously disproportionate. And I mean, you see, uh, and building on that point, I mean, we always uh, one of the myths since we've been talking about myths and and so forth or uh, misinterpretation is that the British Army is this big, respectable, well trained, and everything. But most of these soldiers had ne never seen combat. Probably had never really fired. Uh, I mean. Musket more than what a few training ground shots. I mean, the last major war is ends in seventeen what, or sixty three, so it's almost right. twenty years prior to. So they're on garrison duty or whatnot. And so yeah, the officers, like any of uh, all those conflicts, they're going to need to lead by personal example, which means that they're going to be closer to the front or they're going to be leading. And that's going to lead those the higher casualties. And you see, I mean, that in every war. Um, when the famous quote is what um, the wars are fought on the training of the old, what technology of the new. Right. And so you've got, it's got to right. And you don't know that until you get onto the field of battle. And unfortunately that's where, where, I mean, you suffer those 40% casualties or so forth. Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, to that point, Phil, I think what, this is just the second time, you know, given in a very short space where those, you know, the flank companies of those British regiments, the lights and the grenadier, companies uh this is really the second time that they've been as they're combined together that they're fighting together as one cohesive unit and so their experience is also going to be limited from that perspective as well mm. i would like to uh, let's say slight momentary paul we did have a question come in i want to make sure i get it is why why is bunker hill iconic now we'll move into the, now the battle and, and and so forth itself but why is this bunker hill so iconic in, in the american memory is often called the first battle of the war that leaves out what happens on April 19th. Right. Well, you know, unlike April 19th, it, it's closer to what we think of when we think of a battle. Right. I mean, April 19th, I mean, granted, you have a you have a very brief affair. I mean, this sounds like I'm diminishing and I don't mean to on Lexington Green. Um, and you have exchange of the volleys on the you know North Bridge at Concord, but you know, the, the vast majority of the action on the 19th is the British army trying to get away from Concord and, and being mauled on the way back. Um, Bunker Hill's a, a bit closer to a, um, something like an even engagement where the numbers are not, I mean, there's some disparity, but it's not gigantic. Um, and, and the armies are in some ways very similar in, in profile, certainly in terms of experience. Um, for, for the enlisted men. Um, so I think that the fact that it is, you know, that it is really the first, it's the first pitched battle in the way we think of battle. The fact that it's so public, I mean, you don't have too many Revolutionary War battles, or many battles in general where you have so many spectators. Um, you know, I think I, the American history, you think of First Manassas, but uh, as, a, as a parallel, but but I think it's even more so at Bunker Hill, where we have an entire city sitting on their, on their rooftops, uh, watching the battle unfold, even if they're not able to make out the details. Um, and and that in the um, you know the fact that it is while clearly a British victory the fact that it, it, the cause doesn't end there the fact the American army is still intact in the end most of it gets back to Cambridge and is able to recover and the British are you know are, are too spent to to pursue them at that point uh, in, in in the in the eyes of some it was a victory the Americans had stood up to the British and. Uh, and had given a reasonably good account of themselves, certainly in terms of bravery, uh, had given a, 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 at least a portion of the army, had given a reasonably good account of itself. And I think all those things together, being a first, being a highly visible battle, um, and, and and coming at a, you know, at a, a, a kind of an important time. I mean, because Second, Second Continental Congress is just right practically at that moment, creating the Continental Army. Um, that all those things together make it, make it iconic. Um, I, I, I'm not sure where to go beyond that, but I think the, to me those are the things that, that that make it stick out in the memory, in particular. And no, uh, no, exactly. And then, of course, the as you use it, the title. I mean, that we won, won a battle with a good slogan to move around. Americans yes, love yes, yes, a good yes. slogan. Uh, 
and, and don't fire to the lake their eyes. And of course, you have the tragic uh, death of Warren, who I mean mm -hmm. is one of those uh, the, the first martyrs and so forth. Oh but yeah, the, at, the, uh, at the time that's perceived as like much bigger thing than it is today. But certainly, at you know at the time that's a that's a you know the first American martyr, really the first um, first martyr of the cause. I'm sorry, I wonder like uh, what did he have? Like did he drink the proverbial or the colonial five hour energy? I mean, this guy doesn't sleep. I mean, one well, yeah. here, <laughs> there. I mean, I know he's suffering migraines, and I'm thinking, man, I I have modern technology can drive a car sixty miles an hour, and I can't get to half the things done. That he seems to be doing here, there, and everywhere. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. no, he he's, he seems almost superhuman, and uh, um, and and then a uh, a figure that that's been, I mean, much as I much as I harp about about Ward, Warren's disappearance from the um, you know from the grand American narrative is is the more inexplicable. Um, the one about war bothers me more just because it's actually mean spirited. I mean, no, nobody insults Joseph Warren, but Ward is Ward is actually the butt of jokes. Um, but yeah, that that it's a, a remarkable individual. Um, uh, but it, you know, it, it also illustrates something that that I found fascinating about Bunker Hill from the beginning is that you know of the certainly of the American cast of characters, um, virtually nobody. Um, Virtually nobody of the of, of that group ends up in the you know in the pantheon of American leaders for the rest of the war. I mean, only people who come closer Stark and Putnam. Um, you know, Ward's career is essentially over, and Putnam's career is over. You know, shortly after that, which probably was just as well for the for the Continental Army. Um, and um, and and Stark, that really is his own his own choice. Obviously, Stark was not the kind of personality to uh, to, to to seek fame. Um, but the fact that 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 initial group is all, I mean, they're essentially might as well be gone by 1777. Um, yeah. They're they're not none of them are there at the end, really. Not in a, not in a significant way. Yeah, and uh, you know, flip the coin over to the British side. What's fascinating there is that you have you know two of the three generals who come over, the three major generals, Burgoyne, Clinton, and Howe. Yep. Two of those generals who participate in that battle, and Clinton and Howe directly, they're going to become commander in chief before the end of the war. Oh um, yeah, yeah. The British in North America. So I, I think that's a very that's an interesting juxtaposition as well. Yes, it is. Yeah, it is. Good point. Well, great, um, great conversation. We actually have a uh, interesting. Uh, Segue. One of the things I wanted to talk about um, uh, was that Bunker Hill may be part of a larger, of course, battle uh, narrative or battle plan for the British coming maybe across the Roxbury and so forth. Question came in is that uh, why was Clinton's recommendation to attack and capture Charlestown Neck, thereby trapping the entire Americans, ignored by half? Was it because of that larger potential battle plan? Well, uh, yeah, there's a couple things that work there. And of course, part of it comes from the uh, the nature of the of the documentary evidence that we have, a lot of which comes from Clinton, uh, and in terms of a timeline, there's a, a couple things there, and these were things that 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 were of interest to me when reconstructing reconstructing the narrative years ago. And I hate to give too much backstory. Years ago, um, the early historian of the American Revolution, Alan French, this is early in the 20th century, he wrote a book about the siege of Boston, and a lot of the ideas that we have about about command of the revolution started with French. Like the notion, for example, that after Bunker Hill, Howe was scared of frontal assaults. I mean, French just conjectured that and all of a sudden it became fact, you know, after 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 French wrote it down. But French had, French had seen Clinton as the voice of reason and Howe engage as the voices of kind of unreasonable conservatism and caution. And his argument was that, that Clinton had said when the officers first uh, got together, once it was known that the Americans were building a fortification on, on Breed's Hill. So this was shortly after daybreak on the morning of uh, June 17th. Um, that uh, first of all, that we um, send a force up the Mystic um, and, uh, and cut, off, cut off Charlestown Neck, of course, and have the Americans in a bag. And how we can cross, uh, can cross the Charles and then we can squash the Americans in between. Um, and that we should do this right. We should do this at daybreak. Now, two things there. First of all, the the capturing the Americans in the bag, and this is where Gage and Howe uh, were were especially concerned. Um, if you put the size force that Clinton was recommending, about 500 men, onto Charlestown Neck, they're potentially in between the American forces 
on Breed's Hill and those on Bunker Hill as well, because there's still some there's some there as well, um, and the main army in Cambridge. So the British would therefore Clinton would stand the, the risk of being the guy caught in the bag and not the Americans. So that's that's one issue. The other issue is, is that if, if Clinton did indeed at that point say, let's hit them at daybreak, he's clearly not talking about then. He's talking about the next day. He's talking about the 18th. Um, and you know, where where French had made the argument, well, no, Clinton's saying hit them now. Well, first of all, daybreak's already happened. Second of all, you can't launch an amphibious assault without preparations, namely at least boats. And the British were not ready for the assault that they were going to be doing the next day. And that's what the 17th was going to be devoted to, was getting ready for the assault on the 18th. Um, so, so Clinton's idea is shot down, A, because it's very, very risky. Um, and second, because Howe's idea was to hit them as soon as possible. Now, to Alan French and to subsequent historians, Howe was saying, well, you know, let's get them at high tide. And therefore, he was being kind of slow about it. Alan French called it the 18th century leisure, you know, that uh, that he was just being slow about it. Or no, how, how as like Clinton understood that amphibious assaults take some preparation. And Howe was actually being very, very, um, taking a big risk by saying we can have an amphibious assault going within a matter of a few hours. Um, so, so I think the the um, the assumption was if we hit them fast, uh, we don't need to risk what Clinton is suggesting with it with a possible uh, with a possible uh, 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 double well, complete envelopment, um, and that if we hit the Americans before they really have a chance to follow through on their uh, on their construction of the uh, the fortification at Breeds Hill. Um, so I, it's, it's just I, here I, I see Gage and Howe, because Gage makes the final decision rather, rather than Howe, um, as being, you know, I think justifiably cautious. Uh, and But being kind of, um, you know, taking a little bit of a risk in going for an immediate or nearly immediate assault on, uh, on, the, on, the, heights of, on the heights of Charlestown. One of the things that, I mean, with, um, going back to French's narrative and other ones that um, don't take, it seem like, into account is that the British, I mean, what we see them at Bunker Hill, could the 500 troops that couldn't lead actually handle this type of mission? Um, the, the style I'd add, the logistics side, that the um, it seemed like that was Clinton's thing. These ideas are great plans, but as we found out, what plans are useless, planning is essential. And oh, yeah. So it's, it, 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 that's it was, one thing I think Clinton's it, knock it, is, is throughout the war. It's kind of Great a universal plans. reaction after the battle when they're taking stock. Well, Clinton and Howe and Burgoyne and, and Percy, you know, especially Percy, I think is Percy to me is still the most interesting figure in the, in the British leadership. Um, afterwards, is that you know clearly we overestimated our our, our the, the ability of our men to carry out um, what our plans were, and of course Howe's initial plan was a turning movement was to hit the American left flank uh, along the Mystic River Beach. Well, that. While that was clear, and it wasn't just a matter of that 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 Stark managed to plug that gap before the British light infantry uh, hit, um, is that the, the the response of the British light infantry was precipitous flight. I mean, yeah, they took they took ghastly casualties, but this is not what Howe expected. Of course, they're going to take high casualties in a uh, in an assault like that, but um, but if they keep pressing with the bayonet, the Americans would would have folded. Um, so that you know, that take carrying on something like Clinton is proposing, yeah, that's that'd be of some concern. Although I think it's not till after the battle is over that that British officers really recognize, um, you know, the the uh, the shortcomings of their troops. Um, yeah, and I, but, yeah, and I think it's interesting too. Clinton, I believe, makes mention somewhere in his papers that he had done a reconnaissance on the night of the sixteenth. He doesn't say where, yeah, but he went out. And he purportedly saw the Americans digging in on top of Reed's Hill, how they could, he could have done that. It's when he doesn't tell us where he went and how he could have seen them through the dark is still, you know, it's, 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 it goes along with some of the things that Clinton, Clinton claims. And I think the other issue with the tides too, is that you have to have that high tide to get in to land on that beach so that yeah. you could bring the boats in, not only unload the men, but unload the supporting artillery, but then go back out and come back come back for the second wave while the tide is still in your favor. Okay. Otherwise <laughs> yeah. you're landing men on a beach and they're going to be sitting there for a long, long time unsupported. Oh, right. Right. I mean, that's, that's, and that's the whole issue. I, that, and again, I think it comes down, especially with French and French reveals his other French was not a student of 
of uh, of, uh, of the military arc. I mean, he really did not. A number of these things were lost on him, and he just said, "Why don't we just hit them immediately?" Well, <laughs> the Charles River is there, you know, and it's uh, and it's tidal. Um, the um, uh, the other the other thing that um, um, and I know I I, I, I mentioned this uh, uh, before um, the um, the fact that the assault on Charlestown and this is something I largely missing from most accounts of the, the most accounts of, of the battle. The assault on Charlestown was not the only thing going on um, on the um, on the 17th of June um, that the um, that the British had in fact um, were in fact. The evidence is that they were planning something against Boston Neck and were carrying it out, uh, which puts a whole new spin on Gage's leadership, um, and, and especially on Ward's, I think. As we get down to, I mean, last 15 minutes, I know uh, we set up these things like an hour is going to take, or going to um, we'll probably fill an hour. Now we're already 45 minutes in. I've got like eight other questions that I need to, to ask you. Uh, but, uh, with the uh, fact, uh, so um, as we run now, just um, what uh, what fascinating, I guess, about the after the Bunker Hill, the the story there um, with the Americans retreating, the British, um, how does it go into memory? We touched it a little bit, but just kind of like wrap up the Bunker Hill battle and put it in the context for those that are just newer to not knowing the true history and just the myths. That makes sense. Um, Putting it into the perspective, what uh, so the Americans retreat, right? Is um, what happens uh, with the Brit the British? I mean, they suffer casualties. The follow up, um, why is there not um, a concerted effort to move? What is the American response after Bunker Hill before it goes into the memory part? Okay, well, you know, in terms of the immediate aftermath, the um, of course the, the, the Americans suffer pretty light casualties and um while they're you can anticipate some kind of a command shakeup because there were clearly episodes of of outright cowardice you know, samuel garrish for example and who just you know essentially essentially ascended bunker hill itself with his men saw the british and <laughs> ran away um followed by a good portion of his regiment um that um uh, there's there's some cashiering. I mean, the, the American artillery uh, is uh, in particular is you know, Gridley's role in this is pretty uh, uh, is pretty pretty awful. Um, but there's so much elation over this, you know, and, and, and that, that fits in with that with that so-called raj militaire, you know, that that uh, uh, that that heightened um, uh, sense of enthusiasm for war, and it confirms, you know, the, some of the ideas that Samuel Adams, for example, have been putting forward that Americans are. Are, are are morally superior to the British, and they'll, therefore they'll they'll do better on the battlefield. Um, but tactically, the response is digging in. And I mean, there um, Putnam and Ward had already built a number of fortifications around Cambridge, and of course, Roxbury was was as as well fortified as Thomas could make it, given his limited uh, resources. Um, but the the fortifications go up thick and fast. In um, in the in the after the immediate aftermath of Bunker Hill, um, even as you know, even as Washington approaches, it's only you know what, about two weeks after Bunker Hill that Washington shows uh, shows up in Boston. Um, for the British, you know, they, they, it is a victory, um, and Charlestown Heights is something they don't have to worry about anymore because American possession of that. You know, had the Americans had, for example, the artillery that they eventually get from Ticonderoga. If they had, had access to that somewhat earlier, the possession of Charlestown Heights would have been more than problematic uh, for um, probably even more so than putting the, putting uh, heavy artillery up on Dorchester Heights. Um, so uh, so the the I think the universal conviction, um, so the Gage had been saying all along and the how and Clinton largely agreed was that Boston's indefensible. It's a, it's, a, it's a stupid idea to try to continue to defend it. That really, you know, Halifax and New York are the uh, are the places that the that the British should be using as uh, as their strategic bases. Um, and I think I think Bunker Hill more or less, you know, more or less demonstrates um, uh, to that that that, uh, that 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 fact. So, um, but the but the British are are significantly drained. You know, I mean, the, the reinforcements that showed up in in, in May had. Had given Gage the possibility of taking some kind of 
you know, significant action against the Americans, but the, the, the casualties and, and the blow to morale after, after Bunker Hill, um, to a certain extent enforce that, uh, um, uh, kind of, kind of create for enforced passivity, uh, for the British, you know, in, in, in Boston. Got a, we got a comment in here and I'm not even familiar with this engagement uh, off the top of my head. So, uh, if you're not, that's perfectly fine as well. But um, the Battle of Chelsea Creek. Oh, and if... yeah, it's very uh, the, the, the also called Battles Island. And it's the same. Uh, what, what's the question about it? Just uh, why is this always seemingly ignored? Well, it's, it, it, it's, um, it's ignored in a way that other, um, you know, anything that's not a uh, a, 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 a major engagement is a significant, a significant matter. Certainly, is a huge boost to American morale. Um, the um, 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 the American um, raid on Hog Island and um, um, and, and Otto's Island um, is, a, is a is a humiliation for the British. I mean, even though the Americans don't manage to destroy the naval stores that um, uh, that were uh, that were actually on um, on on Nautils. Um but they managed to walk off with a great deal of livestock and destroy a lot, a lot of others. The big thing, of course, is the um, is uh, um, the, the the fate of the um, of the H of the sloop HMS Diana, uh, which is um, runs aground and um, um, and uh, eventually is well. Long story short, Putnam and his men destroy the ship. I mean, the, the British have to watch as one of their own ships burns and it explodes. Uh, 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 because of a uh, essentially an act of vandalism by uh, by by American soldiers, it's a it's a huge boost to American morale, and it shows you know the kind of thing that Putnam was good at. Um, Putnam was fantastic for that kind of thing. Um, I mean, not very good at divisional command, but uh, um, but you know it, in in the in the long run, I think you know the the Chelsea Creek Nautilus Island engagement is is significant in the sense that. Um, uh, it, it one of those things that holds the army together, so that there is an army to fight at Bunker Hill. Um, that uh, that that boost of morale is, is significant. It doesn't really it doesn't really change a lot strategically, but uh, um, if, again, if it's ignored, it's because uh, we uh, the historians, or rather rather um, you know, popular popular perceptions of most Revolutionary War battles are, you know, pretty pretty narrow, right? I mean, in the same sense that. Stony Point, which is a you know much you know, much much more significant engagement, is essentially unknown except the people who actually study the revolution. Just one oh, good point. I have never even heard of uh, a Paul Chelsea Creek uh, before this, and I actually mm -hmm. study uh, the uh, the American Revolution. So there's a lot of things that we'll slip through. Um, last question I have, and then I'll pass it over to Dan for any final one is. Um, the whites of their eyes was that picked by you or the uh, the publisher? Um, I know that there's a little bit. Is that factual? Did he really say that? We can't it, not talk about Bunker Hill and talk about the most famous quote. Yeah, we don't know. We don't know who said it. If anybody said it, I mean, it's been attributed to Prescott. It's been attributed to Stark. It's been attributed to uh, to Putnam, um, and and attributed to you know Frederick the Great. <laughs> I mean, it's, a, it's one of those one of those uh, one of those bits of uh, of, of war that it, it's difficult to to, uh, to, to pin down. Um, I honestly, I chose the title, and my my point at the time honestly was was, was name recognition more than anything else. And this was something that was especially was important to my editor at Harper Collins at, at that at that point uh, that uh, that there be something. Now, uh, interestingly, I had originally I had originally was thinking about just calling it Bunker Hill, uh, and of course. Nat Philbrook's book, which came out what two years after mine, is called Bunker Hill. Even though it's a little less less focused on Bunker Hill than mine is, and I and it, sometimes I regret not having not having gone with that. But um, but that was the that was the entire idea uh, behind. Incidentally, you know, I, I discovered this after my book came out. I realized that Jill Lepore had written a book uh, called White to Their Eyes, where she was dealing more with the history of of of, of Americans and Americans and and. and uh, um, well, the uh, Tea Party movement in in, uh, in American history. Um, so, uh, so yeah, two books called "White to Their Eyes" were both on uh, <laughs> both on nonfiction shelves together for a while. Then, any uh, final questions? Paul? Yeah, I, uh, this, this might be. Yeah, I, I do have uh, one one final question. We talked, you know, at the beginning of memory, um, and uh, with Bunker Hill and how that you know tends to that it, that 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 image that memory sticks 
you know, with the United States through the end of the American Revolution, through and into the War of eighteen twelve, up until the time that, you know, into the eighteen twenties, eighteen thirties, eighteen forties. Talk a little bit about Daniel Webster and his connection to Bunker Hill, not just being, you know, a, a native of Massachusetts, but you know, I, I know that he was heavily involved with uh, the uh, dedication of the monument that you know we see there today. Well, it was two orations on on Bunker Hill, or or uh, you know, that, I'm, I'm, and I'm sure that's one of the one of the things that is that has given some given some life to Bunker Hill as a um, um, as a as a as a historical as a cultural phenomenon. I, I don't know what to say. I don't say beyond that, but but yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I wasn't I, it hadn't even entered my mind. The um, the, in, the the commemorations of in fact the especially the I can't remember the, the the last of the uh, monument commemorations where they put up, put up the you know the, the permanent monument um, were 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 big deals of course in in, in Boston um, and and Webster who had a you know a national reputation by that point his um, you know his his uh, pre letting his presence there gave a you know a huge boost I think to the um, uh, to um, awareness you know, historical awareness of the battle. Memory is uh, important. I mean, it's uh, it's now also a national park site that kind of helps with it. Uh, Daniel Webster yep. um, and so forth. So we're going coming up on two fiftieth. But before that happens, unfortunately, we're coming up on the top of the hour here uh, for the Red Bull Rubbery uh, segue there. But um, would like to um, remind everyone, go get your copy of the book here, uh, White to Their Eyes, um, especially some light reading for next June. Um, Paul has also written a great one on Auburn, Von Steuben, um, and and so forth as well. So highly recommend. Um, thank you, Paul, for uh, joining us here tonight. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, Revolutionary Board. Thank you, Dan, as well for uh, coming back on. Uh, just in two weeks, we'll be back on with a uh, topic as well. I think we're moving to the Southern Theater, so pay attention to uh, the talk there. Um, and of course, as well, uh, continue to check out our blog uh, at emergingrevolutionaryward.org. And if you're interested, we won't be doing Bunker Hill uh, specifically, but in October this year, the Emerging Revolutionary War annual bus tour. Uh, this will be the third or fourth iteration uh, coming up here. Third or fourth. I can't, we're doing them so much, I can't remember. But we're heading to Lexington and Concord, talking about the beginning of the American Revolution. So check out the blog for that uh, because we're moving up to early October. Uh, so that way we can take in front of the sites there. So once again, thank you all for joining. Um, and we hope you have a good rest of your evening. And see you back here on two weeks for the next Red War Revolution.